Welcome to VCR, a vintage cinema rewind. We're bringing old movies to new viewers. I'm Blake. And I'm Michael. And today is part one of our deep dive into Martin Scorsese. That's right. It's director month again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Last year. Who did we do last year again? You did um Thief. Who was oh, Michael... yeah. We did Michael Mann last year. Right, that's right. right. I was going to I was going to say Michael Madsen, but that's an actor. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. yeah. Um so we're following up one of the great crime directors of all time with one of the great crime directors of all time. Just one, one of the great directors of all time. Yeah, like, yeah, period. Yeah. Definitely one of the most prolific and uh, important directors especially over the past 50 years. Uh Martin Scorsese's turning 81 this year and wow. I was looking at his post production. The reason why we're doing Martin Scorsese is he's got a a uh, very hyped movie coming up later this year called Killers of the Flower Moon, which is based on a true story and the novel that was written based on the true story and it's starring Leonardo DiCaprio. That's right. A actor who is not controversial at all, <laughs> <laughs> or at least not being roasted in the public eye. Yeah, I, like he's being roasted more or less. Like he's, It's not like yeah. he's going around uh, doing stuff like some of our other uh, actors, producers, and other creepos of Hollywood are doing. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he's keeping it yeah. legal. He's just also keeping it weird, I guess, so. And uh, the subject of creepos is going to come back in our discussion of this film. Yeah, very, very uh, shortly. We're doing um, the 1991 remake, Cape Fear. And da, 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 da. I'm trying to do the theme, but I'm kind of failing. Yeah, I actually played it a few times before I uh, before we hit record, and now I forget it because I'm sitting in front of a, a mic and a camera here right now. But You're yeah, sitting in front of two mics, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> true but uh yeah it's it's a pretty like in your face kind of score and it's something that kind of gets into your your brain a little bit this movie was very stylish just across the board yeah like in terms of like staging framing soundtrack like some visual effects like it's very i was kind of surprised i mean i'm not like a huge scorsese guy but like i was surprised by how kind of like flashy this movie was Uh, see and i am a big scorsese guy and i was also pleasantly surprised because as as we'll talk about maybe in who this movie is for like it's really interesting because this movie it feels like an older movie in a sense but with like the touch of an expert director and and because of how prolific martin scorsese is and especially in the last like 10 15 years like some of the movies he's put out Going back and watching this, it almost gives you a nostalgia for his newer films as well. It's a it's a really interesting dynamic. A weird, like chronologically confused sense of nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So before we talk about the plot, I just because we're talking Martin Scorsese movies, I do want to mention some of his other films that you probably have seen before. And if you haven't seen, you should go check these out because they're some of my favorites of all time. Not to cut you off, but before you get into it, I should say that like. I was looking at Scorsese's filmography in preparation for this, and it's he's got one of those filmographies where you're just like, oh, he did that too, and then it's like, oh, really? He did that as well. Like, yeah, it, I was. He's got a lot of range. It's predominantly like some of his most famous films, uh, like I'll talk about in a sec, are are definitely crime films, especially relating to the mob. But there's also some children's movies. There's some musicals. Um, there's a few comedies in there. Mm-hmm. he's kind of known for having comedic elements in a lot of his films as well. And and there's definitely a little bit of, of comedy in this film, if, if anything, just for some of the preposterous scenarios that happen. Um, some of the there's re- some very dark comedy in this movie. Yes, yeah, very, very black <laughs> there's, comedy. There's one moment in particular that, like, I don't, I don't really... I'm one of those assholes where, like, if I think... See, if I'm watching something and I think it's funny, I'll just nod like, hmm, yes, that's very funny. <laughs> but there was one moment in particular in this movie where I actually caught myself laughing and then almost being a little ashamed of myself right. for laughing at it. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, definitely, it's definitely an interesting movie and a def- definitely an interesting experience to watch. And there's there's even some reasons why in particular that I have that, that feeling. But anyway, back to Martin Scorsese. So the film's that he's most known for are films like Goodfellas, Casino, Wolf of Wall Street, The Departed, Shutter Island. Like 
half of those movies there are probably in my top 10 list to be honest so like they're they're all good movies yeah they're all incredible yeah. films like he's also done the children's movie hugo yeah like he's he has movies from the 70s and 80s that were incredibly famous like taxi driver and raging bull but then like i said like we've got this this kind of scorsese sans in the 2010s of of uh casino and the irishman and, and wolf of wall street and films like that yeah have you seen the irishman that's i feel like you haven't that is my one gaping hole in my martin scorsese filmography actually oh. i've seen a lot of his films especially the ones post 2000 and that is the one that uh, it's just because of, I guess, how busy I've been the last few years. I just haven't had time for that one quite yet. It's a commitment, too. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. I will say that the I, I watched it a couple years ago with my parents. Um, during COVID, I moved back home for a little bit. And, like, I will say that watching The Irishman is almost more interesting now that I've seen Cape Fear. Mm. Like, in the progression of, like, Robert De Niro and Scorsese and, like, their collaboration and, like the type of characters they portray like yeah and, th and that's yeah. that's a good point as well because robert de niro is uh one of the main characters of the film playing the antagonist max katie and mm -hmm. like maximilian this is, katie this is a very <laughs> interesting performance of his and it almost feels like outside of his normal roles that he does yeah where i wouldn't say he's always necessarily the good guy but He's a pretty despicable human being in this film, and scary, too. Yeah, genuinely unsettling. Right. It's funny. I, I kind of had this reaction watching this movie where I'm like, I'm not really used to seeing De Niro playing a bad guy, but then I thought about it. I'm like, wait, of course I am, right? <laughs> like, he played Vito Corleone, like, Travis Bickle. Like, I've seen him totally play bad guys before. But, yeah, this was – I feel like – It's a different kind of charisma, right? To Yeah, and – yeah, and also, like, at least with Travis Bickle and Vito, like, you're kind of, like, the movie is kind of on their side, mm -hmm. or at least sort of frames things from their perspective, whereas with this, it's just, like, oh, like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, and, and so this month becomes almost a Robert De Niro month as well, just because also how how often Robert De Niro works with Martin Scorsese over both of their careers. They started at a very similar time, uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're similar ages, and they've collaborated many times together. And I think this was their actual, their seventh collaboration at this point in time in 1991. I was watching this again and, like, taking it all into account. I was trying to think, like, has there been another more iconic director-actor pairing than Scorsese and De Niro? There's very few. Like, you know, every director has their person, right? Like, you can go back to Quentin mm -hmm. Tarantino and Samuel Jackson, and uh, Sidney Lumet has done uh, some films with some very notable actors, uh, and I'm kind of blanking on names. Yeah, there. and I mean, they've all got their little stable of collaborators, yeah. but I'm trying to think, is there anyone, like, I heard in an in interview Scorsese called De Niro closer than a brother, mm -hmm. and I was like, that's really sweet, but also probably very accurate. I like, mean, I mean, I guess second closest probably is Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio, so... <laughs> also that, yeah. <laughs> the only other one I can think of off the top of my head, and I'm also saying it a little facetiously, is like maybe Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. Yeah, no... That's the only other one I can think of where it's like, oh, those guys just can't stop working together. Yeah, 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 for sure. So we, we've talked about the movie actually in quite a bit of detail and for our primer episode here, but maybe let's talk about the plot and then get, get into yeah, the I kind of Yeah, I kind of took us in the wrong direction. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's a good discussion. Let's bring it back. Yeah. So Sam Bowden is a prosecuting attorney in the South, um, New Essex specifically, and while just hanging out, and like he's... He's a good guy, but he's a little sleazy. Like, you know, yeah. he's got a wife. He's got a daughter. He's maybe kind of sort of in the process of cheating on his wife. Yeah. You know, he's at least considering the idea pretty strongly. And anyways, at the same time, a convict, a serial rapist, well, a convicted rapist played by Robert De Niro, Max Cady, is released from prison. 
And the deal is, 14 years ago, Sam represented Max Cady for his uh, rape case, and he was able to drop it down to battery, but Max Cady still spent 14 years in prison. So now, having been released 14 years later, he blames Sam for failing to represent him properly and is now out for vengeance. Right, yeah. And there's a couple hidden details that I don't know if we should get into in the primer episode, but it's it's essentially becomes a weird game of cat and mouse where Max Cady was, 14 years ago, he was sort of like this illiterate hick who had to be read everything by Sam. Right. But he spent the last 14 years basically becoming like the criminal version of Batman. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's no, it's actually kind of impressive. Like he taught himself how to read. He's like studied all these law textbooks. He's in like tremendous physical shape. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's interesting how he kind of is beating the lawyer at his own game where he's like harassing him, but also like not specifically doing anything illegal. Yes. At least at the beginning where he's like, Hey, like I'm just hanging out, <laughs> you know? Well, and that's, that's it's almost comical in the beginning part. We'll probably talk about this more in the deep dive as well. Like the law, like everywhere that Sam turns for help, they're basically like, "No, oh, there's nothing we can do. He's not really doing anything." And and it's yeah, like, right. But like, but like, let's think of who this man is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, there's a line. So later in the movie, Sam hires a private investigator to help him out, and the private investigator, who by the way, like this is a mild spoiler, turns out to be the world's most incompetent private <laughs> investigator. <laughs> he said he does say something very wise though, where he says like the law is like very just or whatever, but like in personal cases like this, the law is like slow and skeptical. Right. Like, yeah. So. And that's a good way to put it. Like throughout the movie, it feels like it feels like Sam is being put on trial. And that's actually probably an important theme that reoccurs throughout the film as well is the trials of Sam. You know how I would describe this movie to someone is it's like it's like the Count of Monte Cristo, but from the perspective of the guy who's getting revenge. Right. Or no, no, no. It's the Count of Monte Cristo from the bad guy's perspective. Or no, man, how am I? How do I describe this properly? (laughs) It's like. Yeah, the Count of Monte Cristo is a famous novel about a guy who's wrongly convicted and he comes out of prison later with this new identity and with all these new resources and he avenges himself upon these people who wronged him. So it's the Count of Monte Cristo, but from the opposite perspective. Right. Like it's the Count of Monte Cristo from the perspective of the person who's getting revenged upon, if that's even a term. <laughs> like he doesn't just... Like, I was kind of thinking, I'm like, well, how is this two hours? Like, what's he going to do, right? But he doesn't just, it's not like he's out just to kill Sam. He's out to ruin Sam's life. Yes. Like, think think the last yeah. season of Better Call Saul, even, in a sense. And I'm- Yeah, ex- absolutely. Like, okay, no, no, no. Here it is. It's the last season of Better Call Saul from Howard's perspective. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. exactly. And he's even a lawyer, right? So I bet you there are some themes that were definitely taken and, and used in, in Better Call Saul. And Better Call Saul often calls back to these famous works from the 80s and 90s, yeah. too, right? Yeah, Better Call Saul just keeps getting better in hindsight. <laughs> The only other thing that I want to say is that this film also starts out similarly to our experience at John Wick 4 with a terrible theater guest uh, that you're stuck sitting beside. Okay, so Blake and I, Blake, <laughs> I, and his fiance went to see uh, John Wick 4, and there were these two assholes sitting next to me who were just talking the entire time. <laughs> like, loudly talking. Like it- Yeah, 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 like commenting. Right, yes. and I made eye contact with the one guy several times, and he was smiling at me like, "Hey, like, yeah. can you believe this? Like, <laughs> We're part of the joke." Like, yeah, it was, so... it was very irritating. It, it, like, uh, like I get going to the movies to have a good time, and, and especially in like a horror movie or something like sure. that, that's very like audience participative, but. There becomes there's audience participative when everybody's like yelling or like laughing together, and then there's like just talking. A running commentary. Yeah, yeah, it's really annoying. It's almost like um, you know, like Stadler and Waldorf from like the Muppets. It's like imagine sharing a theater with them where they're just like <laughs> nattering at the movie the whole time. You're like, guys, come on, like I just want to enjoy the movie. But I will say this: 
Uh, we both enjoyed John Wick 4 so much that we still enjoyed the movie despite those hassles. Yes, yeah. I yeah. I would love to talk about John Wick 4 more, but I am sure at least one or both of us will probably end up having that somewhere in our, our top five at the end of the year. Or maybe that's just my thoughts. <laughs> I was going to say we're probably both going to end up going to see it again at some point. I mean, I know. the window is getting close, though, to wrap it up. Like, if you, oh, if yeah, you haven't seen right. it yet and you kind of want to, you're probably on, like, the last two, three weeks of, of it being in theaters. It's kind of like when Endgame or the first Avengers came out, where it's like you had three groups of friends who all wanted to see it, so you ended up seeing it, like, three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, though, but what really annoyed me about that John Wick 4 experience is when afterwards we went out to get ice cream and the guys followed us there. <laughs> and uh a truck drove by and they disappeared <laughs> and then they paid for our ice cream like how which offensive. was nice i guess <laughs> but <laughs> anyways we're losing the thread here yeah but so <laughs> also it's a very i will say maybe this is jumping ahead a bit but like robert de niro's performance and character really does steal the movie oh easily yeah maximilian katie like he's so like there was, I was watching this movie, and I'm like, this guy shouldn't be so likable, but he kind of is. <laughs> like, in the most, like I said again, in the most despicable, like get under your skin kind of way. Mm-hmm. He's he's a love to hate, like just oh yeah. So let's get into the characters of people you know because we're already talking about Max Cady. You've outlined him pretty well. We've talked about Robert De Niro, household name. What I will say, and this Jess pointed this out immediately, and I was like, you know, you're actually onto something here. Is Robert De Niro looks like Joaquin Phoenix in his portrayal of the Joker in in 2019's Joker film. And you, you know it's 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 sorry to cut you off. It's almost it's a cle- whenever there's like a very charismatic villain who's kind of funny, it's almost a cliche to compare them to the Joker. Right. But he really is a lot like the Joker. Well, and and this is the thing is that the film Joker is actually heavily based on another Scorsese and Robert De Niro film Mm -hmm. called The King of Comedy. And that came out, uh, I think, a couple years before this one. And so there's that influence. There's one other influence uh, from Martin Scorsese's filmography from around this time. And I really wouldn't be shocked if Joaquin Phoenix was also kind of somewhat inspired by Max Cady and his performance there as well. And especially, like, the long hair, the, the gaunt figure, although... Robert De Niro's figure in this is more of a jacked gaunt than a gaunt yeah, gaunt. Yeah, he's like a... <laughs> <laughs> he's freaking huge. Yeah, he looks great. There's a scene <laughs> early on when, like, he takes all his cl- he takes his shirt off in, like, the police station, and he's got all these, like, tattoos and muscles and, like, mm-hmm. the Bible verses tattooed all over him. Yeah. The one, the one cop is like, I don't know whether to look at him or read him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some great so. quotes in this, too. Mm-hmm. So you've already mentioned as well Sam Bowden, the protagonist, I guess, of the film. He's played by Nick Nolte, who's got a very distinct look and a very distinct voice, I'll say. Yeah. And I, I definitely have picked up on his voice before, and that's because of a very recent. He actually was voicing a character in The Mandalorian that's appeared on several episodes. Oh, that's right. The old guy. Yes. the uh, I think his name is call or cool for those of you listening he's the guy in the first season who's just always like i have spoken yes that's exactly who it is that guy so very very well-known voice you probably have seen him in the last 10 years either uh or actually getting over 10 years now holy crap time moves quick in the 2011 film warrior and also in tropic thunder uh, which is one of my favorite comedies of all time (laughs) who is he in tropic thunder i can't remember he is the army guy who they're basing the film off of. Oh, the guy with the hooks for hands. The, yes, the guy with the hooks yeah. for hands. Yeah. Who spends a lot of time with Eastbound and Down. Uh, what's his name? The oh, What's the comedian's name I'm thinking of? Danny. Uh, Danny. Uh, I'm, DeVito? No, 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 no. I got to pull this up because now it's going to. Oh, me. Danny McBride. Danny McBride. Yes. That's who yeah, he spends a lot yeah, of the yeah. film with in that paired up with. And, and they make a really funny comedy duo together. But anyway, um, getting back to the film again. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam Bowden's character is really interesting because he's a, he's the protagonist of the film. It's he, he centered around him. And, you know, the film is about him potentially kind of train wrecking this guy's client's case and sending Max Cady to 
jail for a long period of time. But at the same time, he's somewhat justified in it because Max Katie is a terrifying human being who should never have been released from prison. It's terrifying. He's a terrifying... He's ter- Okay, I- I'm not making sense right now, but he's terrifying. Yes. Like, <laughs> and, like, what's worse is that he's charming, too. Yes. Like, there's a couple of scenes where he's talking to someone, and you're like, all right, like, Jesus. Like, yeah, and- he's clearly... And and that's partially like on the shoulders of Robert De Niro's performance, right? Like he mm-hmm. he is just such a charismatic performing actor that like it doesn't matter if he's the good guy or the bad guy, he's going to carry a movie. Yeah, he's very Yeah, I don't know. Definitely there's... definitely one of the greatest actors. Of... I'm not going to get in we we should save this for our next episode, but there's a scene where he has to seduce one of the characters and like it's very believable that someone would be seduced by this guy. Oh, more like, on that later. More on yeah, that later. More on that later. Okay, so we got to round out the rest of Sam's family. So uh, there's Leigh Bowden, uh, played by Jessica Lang, who, uh, so that's that's his wife. And Jessica Lang, you may know of recent from the American Horror Story series. She she was in a lot of the earlier seasons. She she was older at that point, um, obviously. And and she's been kind of a TV character actor for a number of years since this. She has a pretty good performance in this. Like, I, I don't want to say there's any bad performance in this specifically, but that's where you may have seen her from. Uh, and then we've got their daughter, uh, Danielle Bowden, who is played by Juliette Lewis. Uh, very, very famous actor from the 90s. Uh, she was kind of a child actor of the 80s and 90s. Very, very actually important to my cinematic experience like being in films like christmas vacation and oh yeah dusk till dawn like she she's been in a lot of hit films in the 80s and 90s probably a household name i would say or or very close to a household name um natural born killers as well kind of being the other one and of recent she's actually been in some tv shows lately as well that have been relatively popular uh specifically in Yellow Jacket, she's had a starring role as well as Welcome to Chippendales. Um, I haven't seen either of them yet, but Yellow Jacket sounded really interesting. I've never even heard of either of these. There's just mm. there's just so many shows. Yeah, we're kind of in like this prime golden age of good TV. Mm-hmm. For better or worse, personally, I think that uh, Hollywood and film has been suffering the last few years. And so it's nice to be able to escape into a good TV show. Yeah, and, and that's part of why this podcast came around too, is because there are previous eras of film that are just so fascinating to watch and and enjoyable experience. Hey guys, remember when films were good? <laughs> like... Remember when they didn't star X superhero and over X storyline of how they got their superpowers and triumphed over evil? Yeah, jeez. But anyway, there's a couple other actors and characters that I want to mention in this film. And the reason why I want to mention them, them is because they were actually the three starring roles of the original film that I mentioned earlier from the 60s. Mm-hmm. So Gregory Peck makes an appearance. He played the original Sam Bowden, actually, and he plays Max's lawyer later in the film. He makes an appearance and he actually which it's kind of funny that he plays Max's lawyer because he was actually the main character Atticus Finch playing the lawyer in To Kill a Mockingbird, a very very famous no novel. Shit. Yeah, and film um, that a lot of us have probably seen in in English class. You know, when his name came up on the opening credits, Gregory Peck, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know who that is. Like, I've definitely heard that name before. Yes, very prominent actor of the 50s and 60s, and it's funny the so the police chief of this film actually was Max Cady of the original film. Mm. and the judge was the original police chief of the film that's really funny yeah uh so it's really cool it's it's cool to have these kind of callbacks to the older film and and these kind of cameos almost Mm -hmm. and and i think it's done well now you know you and i are coming from uh over 30 years ago when this film was made and like almost 60 years ago or approximately 60 years ago and from the original one was made and so you know we don't immediately get the references but it is cool to kind of have that background and understanding of of kind of how how the cameos uh worked even back then i wonder what it would have been like when this movie came out for our parents generation if they would have got like oh hey oh i bet you they would have i bet you they would have 
But uh, there is one other appearance that I, I want to mention, and I, I want to know if you recognized him. Um, it's Sam's co-worker in the film that he makes only a couple of very small appearances, but I was like, I knew, I recognized him instantly, and I, I don't know if you would recognize his, him as quickly as I did. Are you talking about the more, like, heavy set, yes. kind of, like, balding, his older co-worker? Yes. No, I don't think I remember him from anywhere. He is uh, the air traffic controller named Trudeau from Die Hard 2. Really? Okay, well, I haven't seen Die Hard 2 in, like, 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the Die Hard series is uh, is an annual watch for me, so I was, like, instantly like, oh, okay. cool. The little uh, connection there, he is. there to Die Hard 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, who is this movie for? This is a really, really interesting film because it's it's not a film for everyone. And, and it's been a while since we've gotten to say not a film for everyone, I don't think. Because it's extraordinarily tense. It's, it's a very well-made, unsettling, psychological thriller and horror mm-hmm. film. But it's also kind of got... A an eighties aggression to it, um, like the it's it's a pretty rapey film, and it's gonna make you uncomfortable. Like it's a, it's a very violent film as well. And there is one particular scene mm-hmm. depicting a sexual assault. By the way, what is with us in? It's two sexual assault movies in a row. But yeah, I know. I was I thinking know. about that too. <laughs> I do like. I mean, I certainly won't. You know, it was tasteful in this movie it seemed tasteful enough but also like watching it again i'm like this makes me uncomfortable and i don't think you could have done this nowadays yeah i I... think i think nowadays if you because essentially what happens is it's a sexual assault that's used to further the plot i think people would be very upset about that yeah nowadays i i very much agree and what's very interesting about this film is its relationship to the original film and the source material of the novel. Um, And I think we'll save that discussion for the deep dive, though. But this film is definitely a part of the sign of the times and and when it came out. And also a little bit of the director's hands, right? Like, Scorsese is known for having these over-the-top violent scenes in his films. Yeah. I would say, like, I didn't find you know counterbalancing what we just said i didn't really feel like any of the female characters were like i didn't feel like this movie had like a con like a misogynistic attitude no like the one the wife in particular is actually one of like she's actually one of the strongest characters in the movie right so i didn't that one scene aside i felt like this movie was it wasn't like you know like you go back and watch some movies from like 40 years ago and they'll say the women will do something or the characters will say something to a woman. You're like, whoa. Right. But I didn't really have any of those moments with this one. Yeah, that's fair. I think that, like, we've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but it's a really fascinating film because it feels like an older film because of the source material that it's based on. But Martin Scorsese brings just such a, a masterful director perspective to the film like some of the cinematography of this film is absolutely stunning like some of the camera the usage of the camera it's like the car- camera almost becomes a character of its own at parts of the yeah movie. definitely so if, if you're into like checking out H- alfred hitchcock and his filmography this film definitely is heavily influenced by his filmography as well mm-hmm. and so this actually what i was thinking about today was this film almost becomes a jumping off point for alfred hitchcock's filmography because it's a newer film than alfred hitchcock's most famous films of the 50s and 60s i think that as as a modern viewer this is something that you can watch and if you really appreciate it and if you really uh, appreciate the director's uh style then then i i think you would go back and, and check out hitchcock's filmography and really enjoy some of his prior films like psycho Mm. for example yeah absolutely and i think kind of looking at the modern day films like i've already mentioned joker but you and i watched uh green room over this weekend and we sure did and oh boy is that film a very very intense unsettling it's probably like the most intense unsettling film i've ever watched and and this film has a similar feeling to it like where it's just you're always just kind of got that pit in your stomach 
of, of fear almost. Like it's a very primal kind of fear that these kind of movies elicit in, in me anyway. Again, not getting too much into spoilers until the next episode, but like that seduction scene I mentioned, it goes on for like five minutes and the whole time you're just like, fuck. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. You can't, you can't <laughs> oh, no. look, but you can't look away. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. You're just like, I don't want this to happen. <laughs> yeah. And and on that yeah. note as well, like like I again, I got to say that Robert De Niro's performance is is one of uh, the best performances of his in my opinion ever. Like it's so unhinged, like it's more unhinged than and scarier than like even something like Taxi Driver where he is supposed to be playing an unhinged character, right? Mm-hmm. But like this one just takes the cake for me. Yeah, I do I do have one note, one thing to say about his performance, but again, I think we should save that for the next episode. Okay, sounds good. Look at me dropping all these uh, call to actions, <laughs> <laughs> pushing everything to next week. Nice. The last thing that I'll say is because this film came out in the very early 90s, a lot of TV and movies of the later 90s heavily were influenced by this heavily parodied this and so we're gonna talk about this but there's a very famous simpsons episode yes starring sideshow bob that if you know the episode that i'm talking about like i was watching this film going i've seen this in a sense and i (laughs) i was immediately like remembering an episode of the simpsons that i haven't seen in probably 20 years but it called back this memory that I had, this very distinct memory of this episode that I had. It's like you get a weird sense of deja vu for a movie you haven't seen. Exactly. Like, Wait. Well, like... and it's kind of a unique experience for me, actually, because this and that's this is coming from the perspective of the audience that we're trying to target, right? Is is a younger audience who maybe hasn't seen these films but have has seen the influence of these films over time, yeah. right? And so I kind of I was kind of excited because like I felt like I was in the shoes of the modern audience for the really the first time, like in, in a long time uh, and seeing this film and really understanding the influences and, and the parodies that have come subsequent to this movie. It's almost, it's almost worth watching this movie. And then imme- if you have Disney plus immediately watching that Simpsons episode, yes, <laughs> you'll get so much out of it. I, I very much agree. And I have more on that later when we get into the spoiler discussion. Okay. Awesome. Do you have any other recommendations for who this movie is for? I'm trying not to say my canned answer that it's for uh, people who are interested in cinema, but like, honestly, I kind of agree. I kind of agree, but disagree with what I know. I agree with what you said that it's sort of an old fashioned movie, but the way it's edited and the way it's shot and the way it's paced, like it felt very modern. Yes. Like it was never, it was never a chore to sit through like some of the other movies we've done. It's very much like, okay, 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 okay. Like, we're going, we're going, we're mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. Like, the plot really, it's paced well. The tension escalates. Like, it's very... Yeah. It's very good. And the stakes continuously escalate. Like, the the sense of dread escalates. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's a very inc- incredibly well-paced film, like you said. And and that's partially probably the time period in which it came out. And, and again, the just the absolute master class of of directing that Martin i can Scorsese i brings. see what you mean though in the sense that like this is almost like the next generation replicating hitchcock yeah exactly you know even um the wife um yeah lay lay like she looked like she wandered off a hitchcock movie mm-hmm. like the typical icy blondes that he always casts yes. like it's like yeah all right like mm-hmm. so even the score a little bit too oh like, we have a lot to talk about the score yeah so anyways when to watch i i really like this as a late night movie it's it's almost got like a sit around the campfire and tell scary stories kind of feel to it and i'm Mm -hmm. i'm and this is again probably because of the sideshow bob simpsons episode like that's where i'm coming from is like i feel like i could sit around a campfire and and tell a version of this story and and tell a very compelling story that people are are drawn into over time it's almost like you're almost doing this movie a disservice if you watch it during the day and i say that as someone who watched it during the day (laughs) yeah i was watching it like i really should have waited till nightfall (laughs) yeah so you agree with me that that's that's the best time to watch it's very um this is gonna sound so obvious but it's very it's a very cinematic experience it it's you deserve it deserves to be watched like on a bigger screen 
with people. Yes, yes. And, mm-hmm. and and there's a feeling of paranoia throughout. And I think if you had more people in a room together, like if I had seen this in a, in a very large environment, like even in a theater environment, it'd be very interesting to see how the audience would react to this film. Yeah, let me tell you, those assholes would not be talking through this movie. <laughs> They'd be dead silent, so scared. There's one very small thing that happens early in the movie where they're like, oh, it seems innocuous at the time, but as soon as it happened, I was like, no, like, that's going to come back later. Like, <laughs> so. I wonder if that's what I'm thinking of as well, because there was one moment in very much in particular that I thought, I wonder if what I'm thinking here is correct. Yeah, I think you should get out of here. So, Where to watch? So right now it's streaming on Prime and Crave Stars. Uh, so I watched it on Prime. It was a pretty good experience on there as usual. I do not have Prime, so I rented it off YouTube, just like always. <laughs> I Hey, remember how last week we said... Uh, Remember how last week we said we should start a Patreon and one of our tiers would be get Michael a new PlayStation? Yep. One of our other tiers should be like pay Michael back for all the YouTube <laughs> rentals he's done over the last eight months. Yeah, but it's worth it. And honestly, like I really enjoy the movie rental experience because it reminds me of like when you and I were kids and we would mm-hmm. bike over to the movie store uh, or the 7 to 11 and go and find a movie to watch that night or two movies, the kind of thing. Like it was always exciting to like have to go out. It felt like, you know, it felt like a, an adventure, it felt like an adventure. Yeah. yeah. I, I kids today, you, you kids today don't understand <laughs> the, um, it was pretty low tech and annoying, but like the excitement of being like, I'm going to go to the, like, I'm going to go rent a damn movie and I'm going to bring it back. And like, There'd be certain movies you'd rent out multiple times because you just liked it that much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I remember there was a, a video store in the small town we grew up in, Preview Video, where me and my sister rented out the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles so many times that they just gave it to us. Oh, my <laughs> they God. Like, here. They were like, here, take it. Like, uh. Yeah, <laughs> like, th- those are experiences that you can't quite replicate, but I, I still enjoy renting movies because it gives me a little bit of that nostalgic dopamine hit. Gives you a little bit of a hit, yeah. Well, there's got to be video stores that are still operating, right? Like, uh, the few and far not. between. I think I think some Seven to Eleven convenience stores have some movies renting, but it's never going to be the same as it once was, right? Um, although, no. if you're on the Seven Seas online, maybe that's a similar experience. And it seems like with how fractured streaming is becoming, pirating is is maybe. Uh, circling back to that and and maybe physical media rentals becomes relevant again maybe actually it's funny um i think i heard on the radio that netflix finally discontinued its like dvd mailing service oh really yeah, they kept it around for a long time just as like a legacy feature but they finally just recently knocked it off what, what was really funny is that your family was using that service before like netflix really was a thing netflix was really taking off yeah we were really we were really early adopters i guess yeah you should we should have yeah. been 20 years old and investing at that point we would have made a lot of money <laughs> we should have like go back and it'll be like back to the future part two or go back in time just like invest in netflix invest in netflix yeah. like 2000 yeah. like six invest in netflix future past me yeah do it maybe prime two and maybe also hbo but we're getting ahead of ourselves just all tech really yeah um but anyway i think that kind of wraps up our primer episode go check this movie out it's it's really cool it's for a very particular set of audience but it was this was my kind of movie that i i'm often looking for a movie that makes me feel something and in this case it made me feel very uncomfortable and unsettled throughout and that's an experience that i appreciate i really i really appreciate those yeah, and as someone with an anxiety disorder, I appreciate that this movie <laughs> could show normal people what it feels like sometimes. Oh, I believe <laughs> that. <laughs> crushing dread at all times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All Jeez. right, well, until next week, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.